thank you, Kristen, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. Um, as this is uh, the philosopher's session, um, I wanted to start by saying a little bit about what the project is. Um, and in fact, and, and to make a slight corrective to the introduction, that uh, uh, the book, Unsimple Truths, in which uh, the, what I'll talk about has some relationship, uh, argues n not that science needs to change so much as that philosophy and science, philosophical views about knowledge and scientific practices uh, about that engage the world to discover features about nature, sometimes get out of sync. And I think more often than not, the philosophers are the ones that are behind the times. So it's more that the philosophical views uh, need to be uh, uh, amended to uh, take account of, in particular, the last, uh, the most recent work in the biology of complexity. So questions, uh, so I wanted to, I'm going to talk today about the ev evolution and the mechanisms of complexity, but in fact, it's, it, so what the philosopher of science, it, like myself, does is, is similar to what the biologist does. The biologist knows that there are certain uh, organisms and systems, model organisms, say, that are really good for understanding certain features of the natural world. So you might use Drosophila to understand genetics, perhaps honeybee, honeybees to understand the evolution of sociality, and, uh, and slime molds to know about non-linear uh, dynamics of aggregation. So there's lots of different systems you study to get at pieces of nature and theories of those uh, bits of nature. The philosopher of science studies you guys, right? Studies the scientists in a way in order to understand, to, the studies the preconceptions, practices, products of science in order to ask more general questions in epistemology. So just like I might want to study a, a honeybee, I'm not, uh, to understand sociality, the results of that are supposed to be more general than just what happens in a honeybee colony. And just because I study the philosopher, uh, sorry, I study the biologists, the results of understanding how we get knowledge of the world, the character of that knowledge, um, and the use of that knowledge are supposed to be ways of getting at a more general understanding of knowledge, the epistemological questions of the philosopher. How do we know, what can we know, and what are the features of the knowable? So my work has focused primarily on uh, complexity, and uh, it, it's my uh, thesis that the recent work in complexity, and I've done some um, modeling, uh, joint work with biologists in modeling self-organization. Um, the recent work in, in, uh, in biology poses real challenges for some traditional views in philosophy that are uh, tied to uh, perhaps uh, the ways in which uh, we, we think science is done on more fundamental physical systems than complex, evolved, contingent, hierarchical, dynamic, complex, biological systems. And so those are the questions I want to raise um, in this talk. But let's start with Darwin. It's his year, right? So what Darwin said was that slow though the process of selection may be, if feeble man can do much by his powers of artificial selection, I can see no limit, and you'll see I've highlighted the relevant pieces of this, no limit to the amount of change to the beauty and infinite complexity of the co-adaptations between all organic beings, one with another and with their physical conditions of life, which may be affected in the long course of time by nature's power of selection. Although the belief that an organ so perfect as the eye has been form, could be formed by natural selection is more than enough to stagger anyone, yet in the case of any organ, if we know of a long series of gradations in complexity, each good for its possessor, that under changing conditions of life, there is no logical impossibility in the acquirement of any conceivable degree of perfection through natural selection. Right? And then he cautions, if you haven't found the intermediaries yet, don't don't despair. And we've had lectures already, both about the complexity of the eye and about the availability and sometimes discovery of intermediary forms in the development of more complex um, uh, organ organisms. But I think what's important 
to raise in this, in this talk is that while Darwin, there were a lot of, if you like, black boxes in, in that Darwin had, had, was unable to open in understanding the full dynamics and processes that are engaged in evolution by natural selection. But as Darwin said, there's nothing in logically that prohibits um, uh, complexity from arising. And though I would s caution that there's more than natural selection that's involved in the generation of complexity. So the logic of natural selection, if you will, does, and in fact, it, it, it doesn't entail that things will either get more complex or, or less complex, and you should expect both things to happen. But what it doesn't do is give you the full story. So the question becomes, how do naturalistic mechanisms um, direct the change from simple to complex forms and behaviors? And it seems that, uh, that there's complexity in um, a number of different dimensions of, of life, including, and, and these, you, these are just triggers to get your intuitions in tune, that some of these are, have to do with uh, complexity that's generated over evolutionary time from more simple to more complex, although the reverse also happens. But it's also the case that complexity develops in time, right? From a single, uh, single cell to multicellular differentiated cells. And so in a way, evolution and development are involved in understanding the ways in which complexity are generated. So what I want to do today is talk about I'm not going to answer that first one, by the way, what is complexity, although I'm going to give you some views about that, uh, because that's one of the issues of which there's a still a lot of, con of, of contention, uh, both in the philosophers and in the biologists and outside of biology circles. But I want to ask what it is, let's get a handle at least on some of the features that we can agree about if there's no clean definition of what makes something complex. How does it increase? How does, if, if, there, if we believe there ha are increases in com complexity? And I think the how question can be really answered by these kinds of mechanisms that generate variation, mechanisms of development, and mechanisms of diversity. But there's a separate question, namely, which is why does it increase? And I think these are questions, if you like, about adaptive significance and perhaps also with, with respect to niche acquisition and niche uh, development. And one of the issues has to do with, um, I would separate these, and I hope, that I'm, I'm sort of hoping the next talk will help here, into uh, more mecha mechanistic from uh, point A getting to point B mechanisms of, that, that tell you how a system goes from a single cell to a multicellular differentiated organism, or a, from a single cellular ancestor to a multicellular descendant. And why questions really ask, in some ways, what we might identify as either teleological t or teleonomic, I'm hoping we'll know more about that after the next talk, namely questions about the goal of why is increased complexity when it arises kept around, right? What does it do for you? Does it increase differential fitness, right? Or the successful acquisition of resources that feed back in this, in, in which I myself would uh, argue are part of teleologic systems, feed back to stabilize the phenomena once it's been generated by some right, forward process. Right? So I think that both the, the how questions and the why questions need to be answered about complexity, and they may look for both internal kinds of mechanisms and what have sometimes been classified as external mechanisms, mechanisms external to the organism or the system that maintain its, its complexity once it has arisen. And then what I really want to focus on, since the biologists have already uh, laid the ground with respect to all, uh, many of the details of, what, of biological complexity this morning, is the so what question. And the so what question is, what's the philosophical implications of what we understand about complexity? And I'm going to look at one particular strain, strain of implications, although I think there are more. So what is complexity? And now we can start rehearsing the very many different things that people have identified from, oh boy, these slides didn't, I can see them on my computer. I guess, sorry about that. I'm not sure why they're so bad. Um, uh, well, the, the first one is just increase in, in gene numbers estimated for metazoans um, and fungus. The second, these are from Valentia Valentine's article. 
estimated numbers are sem semantic cell morphotypes. So there's some question that having more things makes you more complex than having fewer. Is it more genes? Is it more types of cells, right? And it turns out that, that um, and we heard this already this morning, that there's no correlation between numbers of genes and, and degree of complexity. So having more isn't necessarily being more complex. Part of that has to do with the genes that are counted turn to be, tend to be coding genes. And it's important to understand that uh, one of the important discoveries in terms of gene regulation has to do with the fact that much of what's going on, we heard a lot about this already this morning, about, about introns, about, um, about cis regulatory regions that, that sit out in front of the uh, coding section, and that you can have changes, in fact, People, for example, like Sean Carroll wants to argue that it's mutations in the regulatory regions and the cis regulatory regions of existing genes that um, is, is the, the primary source of morphological variation right? and not having new, gene, new functional genes. So there's a lot of conservation of functional genes or coding genes. We've heard about that as well. And so one of the ways in which, so it's not just getting more right, genes that makes you more complex, but changes in the way in which existing uh, genes are, um, are regulated. Um, so it's not neuromorphological changes due to new uh, genes, but rather due to changes, mutations in the regulation of genes. Okay. Um, so what is complexity? Well, here's a couple. Melanie Mitchell works uh, uh, the beyond just biology. She says a system in which large networks of components with no central control and simple rules of operation give rise to complex collective behavior, sophisticated information processing, and adaptation by, via learning or evolution. Um, uh, McShay, who's written many things, this is just one, says heterogeneous, elaborate, or patternless systems are complex. He also introduces the notion that you can have complexity both in a vertical dimension in terms of having hierarchical, uh, more hierarchy within a structure, cell types, organ types, rather than, and as well as horizontal spread, which would be having more parts at a given level. So there's ways of being, there's many ways of being uh, more complex, right? Being a single cell and being multicellular, we all say the multicellular guy is more complex, but there's many ways in which we might cash that out. Uh, my own way of thinking about it is to, is to think that there are w many different kinds of complexity, including the kinds that are uh, compositional, how you, how you build something complex from simple components, the dynamical ones, which tend to be associated with um, uh, nonlinear representations or chaotic dynamics, which is about how things behave in space and time, right? Not how you compose some, some existing object, but how it, how it uh, behaves in space and time, as well as the increased diversity, which is often associated with complexity in biology. It seems that multi-level organization, multi-component causal interactions, right? Plasticity in relation to context variation, right? Its ability to adjust either through, uh, uh, either through evolvability, if you think in an evolutionary time scale, or through some homeostatic or other feedback dynamics to maintain the proper uh, values of the system in light of environmental perturbations, and evolved contingency are all features of complexity. So what are the mechanisms of complexity? And here I really think there is, it's important to see that there are are different kinds of mechanisms. So people want to say, well, is it natural? Darwin seemed to think natural selection, uh, there was no reason natural selection couldn't engage uh, a, a, a dynamics that included increasing complexity. And external features, if being more complex makes you more fit, right, or puts you into, in, in a new niche, right, or engages you in the feedback between niche construction and increasing um, fitness, then these are external s w ways in which uh, complexity may be uh, evolved and maintained if it's generated as a variation in the first place. So there's also internal mechanisms in terms of, the, uh, of genetics and development, right? When we've heard also already heard about doubling, fusing, other kinds of regulatory modifications, these are all ways in which you generate the kinds of variants that are more complex. 
as well as emerging complexity models, which include self-organization. And self-organization is a general uh, uh, means by which a complex higher level structure can arise through the interaction of simpler parts without there being some new uh, blueprint or plan um, that has been instituted in the system or any goal. Okay. So um, what I want to suggest is that, so what? Okay, so I'm not going to tell you the biology. The biologist told us the biology. But what difference does it make that we have these kinds of complexity in biological systems? What does that mean for how we think about uh, what's out there in nature, how we investigate and get knowledge about it, and how we actually act in light of what we know? So what we know in the shape of scientific knowledge, I suggest, are, are shifted when we embrace complexity in the ways in which biologists have, uh, have been um, um, discussing it. In particular, and I'm not going to have time to talk about all these pieces of the story, in particular the, there's been a, a, a really a resurgence in the use of the language of emergence, not just in biology but in science in general, and I used to do this kind of, you know, t Google, t if you Google, Google Scholar, emergence and properties, you're going to get two million hits, okay? And the first one is a paper in science and the second one's a paper in nature. So the language of emergence, which was, was uh, excluded for many decades in science because the reductive uh, methodology was held to be primarily the only one that was explanatory, all of a sudden emergence is back in scientific fashion. Now, what do we mean by emergence is also something that needs to be, if you like, stabilized a little because it means a bunch of different things still. But what's interesting about that is that philo many philosophical accounts of emergence are still following the work of Bertrand Russell to suggest that there are no such things as emergent properties. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So let me get on to um, how we get knowledge of complex causal structures. And this is the one I want to talk about briefly today. And then the other piece, how we act in light of them, these are the things that I discuss in my book. So let's do how do we get it. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, complex uh, biological systems is that they're robust. Okay, and we've heard a little bit about robustness and or degenerate, which is the language that Edelman and uh, Ralph Greenspan like to use in a kind of tipping their hat to quantum mechanics. And namely that there are kinds of structures and dynamically reorganizing structures, and the ones that uh, I'm going to talk about now is a kind of um, abstract model that Ralph Greenspan proposed about a reorganizing uh, genetic regulatory network, and that when we, we accept that those kinds of things are in the world, they make a difference to the way in which we think we can, we can uh, draw causal inferences from experimentation. So briefly, knockout experiments we all know about. Knockout experiments are ones in which the principal assumption is that the normal function of a gene can be inferred directly from a mutant phenotype. And if you're lucky and clever and can create these double mutants, and it's hard work, and sometimes you get terrifically interesting results, if you can create these double mutants, the argument is you should be able to tell what the function of the gene is that you knocked out by looking at a double mutant in comparison. This is standard, so the philosophical reflection of the controlled experiment you can read in the 19th century work of John Stuart Mill. It's Mill's method of difference. You can create two systems in which they're, they're identical in all respects, and of course that's a caveat here, except for one, and there's a, there's a difference in the consequence. You can attribute that difference in the effect to the difference in the, in the two systems that you've created, right? That's just what controlled experiment causal reasoning is about. Now, what, and Mario Papetti, of course, just won the Nobel Prize, I guess, a year or two ago, said, if you give me a gene, I could knock it out and tell you what its function is, okay? So there's a lot of hope in this, and sometimes you can do it, and it's great, okay? Now, the problem is, is that sometimes you can't get the results that you anticipate in doing this kind of single, per, single perturbation uh, knockout experiment. Sometimes the intervention on one gene is lethal, so you know it did something important, but you're not really sure exactly what it did. Sometimes the intervention on one gene can change the phenotype in a way that's predictable, and a lot, and, and a, a lot of this obviously is done for the genetics of disease, and there are some dominant uh, uh, single mutation, point mutation changes that you can discern in this kind of process. 
but these are the ones I'm interested in. Sometimes the intervention on one gene virtually is there no change in the phenotype. And if there's no change in the phenotype, um, that happens in 30 to 40 percent of knockout experiments. So what are you supposed to infer about the causal? These are all, if you like, methods of inferring causal structure through experimentation. So the argument is, what ha why do you get these kinds of cases where you don't get a change in the phenotype? And the argument is that there are cases of either redundancy, right, which is copy redundancy in the language of Andreas Wagner, where you just ha haven't gotten rid of all the copies, so you're, there's some in reserve. It's kind of an engineering model, fail-safe model. But this other method is more, this other system is more interesting. It's degenerate or robust, namely that when a gene is knocked out, elements of other structures respond to issue in a similar functional outcome. So you get a dynamically reorganizing system uh, in response to insult, if you like, through the experimentation. And so this is the kind of model that uh, Greenspan suggests in the article published last year, genome, you knock out that one, uh, that's the effect over there, the structural functional effect, effect. If you knock out this gene, he suggests, what you don't get is what everybody else is doing, and so, what doesn't show up in the, in the double mutant is what that particular node, that particular gene was up to, okay? What he suggests is that when you knock out one, everything reorganizes to, to compensate for that. Now, this shouldn't be unfamiliar to the biologists. This is an interesting way in which robust systems can respond to, to external, or in this case, internal perturbation. But what's interesting about this for the philosopher is that what you can set up the perfect control experiment, and then if the world isn't well behaved, okay, so this is, if you like, a not a well behaved system, you can't draw the right causal inference. You can't learn what its causal structure is by using the standard methods of experimental logic, okay. So the argument then is that some systems don't uh, behave yet because of their complexity in ways that make them amenable to somewhat sta some standard philosophical arguments about causal inference from, from experimental data. Now this is, I, I'm not sure, I don't, probably don't have too much time, is that correct? I have no time. I'll try to wrap it up. Okay, so the next couple of slides were supposed to show you why, why this is important for philosophers, because the, one of the main philosophical um, theories about causation and understanding causation on the table these days has been developed by Jim Woodward, and it's one in which, and, and but this feature about causation, right, this what they call modularity, not to be confused, but it's a relative of modularity in biology. What, what's called modularity is the independent disruptability of, of compl component systems. is supposed to be essential to what we mean by something having, being caused, being a cause. So the parts of a system which X and Y belong must operate independently enough to allow exogenous cause to change the value of X without changing other parts of the system or the environment which it operates in a way as to disrupt any regularities that would otherwise have obtained, et cetera, et cetera. So what this means is that if I have multiple causes and all you have to do th is think of, uh, you know, friction and gravity, right, simple additive causes, if I disrupt one, it doesn't mean the other one, the other one still behaves as it would even with it present, okay? So the question is, is that this characterization of what it is to be a cause, a philosophical question, has been taken to be essential to the notion of causation, okay? You have, it's, it can't be a cause unless it behaves in this well-mannered, modular, independently disruptable way. The flexible genome is one in which it doesn't seem to be behaving in this way, and so, the, uh, so again, so this is, a, a, if you like, an example of why what's going on in biology, what we're discovering about the biological world is, has, is having an impact on how we philosophically characterize the most basic of uh, epistemic objects, causation, explanation, causal inference, and others. And so it's, it's my conclusion, these are options, you, there's always options, right? Uh, whether or not you want, you want to just hold tight to your view that modularity is essential to causation and you think that flexible genome just means that you haven't got a cause, right? That's not a cause. The original genetic structure didn't cause the original functional uh, phenotype. I think that would be a mistake. 
So my own view is to support a pluralistic solution that we want to infer that modular causes do not exhaust all of causality. Some causes in nature are simple, some are linear, some are well-behaved modularly, but what the study of complexity has showed, shown us is that there's lots of causal structures that aren't that, that have other features, and our philosophical analysis has to be one in which uh, we it, uh, account, accommodate and account for both causal inference and causal understanding of complexity. So theories of causality that require linear action, context insensitive uniformity, independent disruptibility, are going to fail to be adic adequately capture the kinds of causal structures biology is currently uh, discovering. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I thought somebody will, might have wanted to ask you a question more immediately related to the impo most important part of your presentation. But I'm going to make a comment about something you said uh, early on, and that has to do with emergence. Oh, uh, sure. Why the disputes about emergence seem to me altogether um, worthless. Uh, I mean, consider hydrogen and oxygen. So when you put hydrogen and oxygen in water uh, together, yeah. you get water. Yeah. Are the properties yeah, yeah. of water emergent relative to the properties of oxygen and hydrogen? I have two possible answers. One says uh, I happen to include among the properties of ox oxygen and hydrogen their ability to combine and produce water, no emergent properties. That's what the reductionists were saying. On the other hand, does it make sense to give that answer? My own view would be uh, that if you can predict the properties of the complex entity by studying the components in isolation, then no emergent properties is fair. You can study in oxygen and hydrogen, but in isolation you can predict the properties of water. It starts to, it, it makes sense to me to say the whether it's not an emergent property, but the fact is that they cannot do that. I mean, no matter how much you study oxygen and hydrogen. And here comes an important point, which is where the biology comes in. The death is conditioned to the state of science. Mm -hmm. It is conceivable that physics will reach a point where by studying oxygen and hydrogen in isolation, they may be able to predict the properties of water. And this is what is happening all the time in biology, in modern biology properties that we would have called emergent because we knew about the components, but we don't know how the components cause the properties at a higher level. In neurobiology, in genetics, in, in ecology, and everything else, now as the science advances, they stop being uh, emergent properties in a way, at least by my definition, because now you can predict those properties from studying the DNA or whatever. Please. Okay. There's a move towards understanding emergence as selecting out certain ways in which you build complex higher level properties from lower level ones, but not necessarily the ones that are unpredictable. Okay, so it loses some of the unpredictability, right? Although if it's chaotic dynamics, it's unpredictable for a different reason. The other, the other issue is that um, I think part of the move towards looking at systems biology and robustness and all of these, these organismic and organismic 
system properties, we should understand there's also one of the features of emergence which is, is uh, identified as downward causation, right? Namely that some of the features of the co very components themselves are causally, causally affected by the, the way in which they're embedded and engaged in a, in a systematic and dynamic organization. And so I think it's true that some things that were thought, in fact, this is what happened to the British Emergence Group, too, that the, the features they thought were unexplainable in the late 19th century, early 20th century, all of a sudden got explained. Although my colleagues will argue about common sense, and I don't know. Okay. They got explained in a reductive way, and that's part of why uh, Emergence left the scientific language. But with the new understanding of dynamics, 